And now it's my honor to introduce my dear professor, Professor uh, Dr. Anibin Gedo, uh, Amgen Symposium, Trastuzumab in HER2 uh, positive breast cancer. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Dear colleagues, um, thank you very much that you are still <laughs> sitting and <laughs> Uh, continuing this uh, long day, our last uh, day in uh, uh, the 8th uh, Ain Shams University International Clinical Oncology Conference. Uh, I want to uh, thank Amagen for inviting me uh, in uh, this uh, symposium, uh, which uh, we will address here a very important uh, topic, which is uh, trastuzumab in management of HER2 positive breast cancer. This is uh, my, the overview of uh, the points that I will cover. First, uh, HER2, just an overview about it, the instance and all of this. Guidelines of treatment approach in early breast cancer. Uh, clinical data of anti-HER2 in early breast cancer. And lastly, the importance of biosimilars and uh, amagen trastuzumab biosimilar in early breast cancer. Uh, first, uh, I would just uh, hurry up and say a, just a, st a very short statement about, unfortunately, the breast cancer mortality um, uh, accounts for uh, a very high uh, percentage of uh, deaths, but uh, fortunately enough that this mortality uh, dropped by nearly one third uh, since 1990. And of course, this because of the uh, breast cancer awareness and uh, screening. As you see here that uh, the uh, breast cancer uh, incident, uh, the incidence of breast cancer cases in uh, Egypt, it's the first uh, in the incidence, but fortunately enough that the uh, mortality is not that uh, high, it's less. For example, if you look here for, here for the liver, the incidence is really parallel to the, uh, unfortunately, the number of deaths. Okay, uh, the HER2 um, uh, cases, they are associated with uh, aggressive disease and poor patient outcome. And as you see here that uh, those patients with uh, HER2 negative cases, they, ha uh, they have uh, better overall survival than those who have uh, HER2 uh, positive cases. Twenty-five percent of uh, the patients uh, of breast cancer, nearly they have uh, HER2 uh, positive breast cancer cases. And uh, here, uh, if we go for the HER2, we would find two subtypes. Those who are HER2 positive, but they are hormonal positive, and those who are hormonal negative. And in either situations, they have a poor prognosis. Uh, this is just a, uh, a diagram to uh, just to show you the uh, signal transduction by the HER2 family, which unfortunately promotes proliferation, survival, and invasiveness of the tumor. This is very important. Uh, when we look and we find, uh, we, uh, leave, uh, we send our uh, biopsy for the pathologist to uh, have the results of the HER2, we are either uh, accounted by the HER2 uh, amplification or the HER2 overexpression. And there is a difference. The HER2 amplification means that we have normal HER2, but they are uh, amplified. We have many uh, numbers of this uh, HER2. But when we look for the HER2 overexpression, no, they, we have a wild uh, HER2, but unfortunately, because they are overexpressed, so they may cause for this mutation. And in either situations, as I said before, they have poor prognosis, 
where the uh, hair to uh, normal, uh, they have uh, from six to seven years uh, median survival, and for the hair to positive, it's uh, three years. Uh, this is uh, to show that the overall survival uh, of those patients who are HER2 positive but they are lymph node negative, uh, it's very important to look for the amplifications. Of course, those patients who had amplified, they have worse uh, uh, cumulative overall survival than those who uh, don't have this uh, amplification. This is just the HER2 uh, subdivisions. Uh, we have uh, four types, the, uh, the majority, which is the, uh, the HER2, uh, uh, they are hormonal positive and HER2 positive also, uh, but uh, if we have the PR, which is the progesterone negative, it is another subtype, or the estrogen is positive and the progesterone, uh, the estrogen is negative and the progesterone is positive, or those the both hormonal treatment are ne uh, hormonal receptors are negative and we have her2 positive this is the survival uh, in relation to the subtypes of the her2 where you can find of course that there is a difference in between the four subtypes where the most aggressive one as you see here is this one at the least which is the uh, uh, both er and pr negative with her2 uh, positive what are the guidelines for uh, treatment of uh, these uh, HER2 positive early breast cancer or even the early breast cancer first? Uh, it has to go like this. You, will put, you have to look for the size of the tumor, whether it is a very small tumor with no lymph nodes, so you can go for the breast conserved surgery. If it is uh, this... Uh, 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 no, uh, the patient doesn't uh, uh, want to conserve her breast, uh, or this uh, breast conservative is impossible. And uh, of course, the, we will go for this uh, mastectomy. And in between these patients who are uh, more than two centimeters, and they are have uh, triple negative or HER2 positive patients, so we can uh, we have to go for this systemic induction, followed according to the response by uh, preservative conservative surgery or mastectomy. And of course, after this, if the patient has HER2 positive, of course you will give um, a post-operative uh, chemotherapy with anti-HER2, uh, followed by the radiotherapy plus or minus a hormonal treatment if present. For the uh, HER2, uh, we have, of course, to give this anti-HER2 uh, as a systemic therapy, and all of us know that we have to give it uh, for uh, one uh, year as an adjuvant. Uh, also, uh, there are high-risk patients that we have to uh, sometimes extend the, uh, the anti-HER2 with this uh, neratinib uh, in some cases. And of course, if the patient received a new adjuvant and there is a residual tumor, so we'll go for the TDM uh, as an adjuvant treatment. So uh, this is a scheme, uh, a schema for the, uh, if we will give new adjuvant, uh, first we will give this a new adjuvant and according to the response, if, it, if she has uh, a pathological complete response and she was initially node uh, positive uh, or ER uh, negative, so we'll go for one year of anti-HER, uh, dual uh, anti-HER2 or one year of uh, trastuzumab as a single agent. And um, also we can give just one single uh, anti-dual uh, HER2, which is the uh, one year of trastuzumab. If the patient, as I said before, if she has uh, no uh, pathological response, she will, so she will go for the TDM1. These are the HER2 targeted agents. Uh, uh, as all of us know, those uh, monoclonal antibodies in the form of trastuzumab, pertuzumab, aduzumab, and also we have uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, the lapatinib, neratinib, and tocatinib. But uh, these are used usually in the metastatic second setting, so I will not speak about it here because we are. Uh, speaking about the early breast cancer. What are the uh, clinical data of anti-HER2 agents in the breast, uh, early breast cancer? Uh, 
These are four, uh, four pivotal trials, which were done on two th uh, 12,000 of the patients with um, HER2, early breast cancer, and it's considered as the standard of care. What did they do? Here, for example, the HERA, the HERA trial, where they gave uh, this uh, uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, plus or minus uh, radiotherapy, and then they followed the patient to either uh, observation or give them the one year of the uh, anti-HER2 or two years. In the uh, PCIRG, uh, 006, uh, they gave uh, four cycles of uh, the doxorubicin uh, cyclophosphamide, and then uh, during the texanes, they gave the one year of uh, uh, anti hair 2. The other arm were that they gave the, uh, the three, uh, the two uh, chemotherapy, uh, uh, which was in the form of docetaxel carboplatin with um, uh, one year of uh, the anti hair 2. For this uh, third trial, which, it, which is the NCCTG, uh, they gave uh, this chemotherapy in the form of also uh, 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 doxorubicin cyclophosphamide, four cycles, and they uh, gave uh, the three arms, either they didn't give the anti-HER2, or after finishing with the uh, taxanes, they gave one year of uh, uh, anti-HER2, or they gave the anti-HER2 in conjunction with the uh, taxanes. The last one is nearly, uh, they, they have just two arms. Uh, the first uh, uh, arm where they didn't give anti-HER2 anti after finishing their chemotherapy, but in the second arm, they uh, gave it one year of anti-HER2 uh, uh, with the um, uh, paclitaxel, uh, the four cycles. They found that, as you see here, uh, the four uh, trials, and as you see here, that they have uh, relatively uh, the uh, hazard ratio is uh, ranging from 0.76 here in the HERA trial, and also here it's 0.6, and lastly in the PCIRG it is 0.75. Uh, this is the affinity trial, because, uh, which uh, Dr. Sabri mentioned uh, in the previous uh, symposium, where uh, it, they uh, tried to uh, randomize the two pa the patients into two arms after doing uh, surgery, and uh, you did this in immunohistochemistry, and you confirmed that this patient has HER2 uh, positive status. So uh, they were randomized either that they re re received the chemotherapy in conjunction with dual anti-HER2, or they received this uh, uh, chemotherapy with just one of them plus the placebo. And they followed the patients for 10 years. First here is uh, after four years, they found that there is 19% reduction in the re risk of the invasive disease-free survival uh, with the addition of the anti-HER2, uh, the dual anti-HER2 versus just one of them. Uh, also, they have also found that the progression uh, event-free uh, percentage uh, differs, of course, with those patients who had received the um, dual rather than the uh, single agent anti-HER2, with a reduction of 23% in the re uh, re reduction in the risk of the invasive disease-free survival. What about the biosimilars? Uh, of course, um, uh, maybe all of us know uh, that uh, in the last few years we had uh, uh, those originator, and these originator they uh, unfortunately uh, have a very high cost. Uh, but on the other hand, we have the generics, and midway these the biosimilars, which is midway in um, in cost. Uh, between the uh, generics and the, bio, uh, and the originator. Also, uh, it takes um, a limited, relatively limited time than the biologics to uh, be uh, manufactured and established. This is, in short, what do we mean by this uh, biosimilars, where we have uh, this uh, immu human immunoglobulin, uh, which it varies in size from one uh, monoclonal antibody to the other. 
Uh, this study, uh, they uh, tried to, which is a phase three study, it was designed in order to see if there is the um, a, a trastuzumab biosimilar is uh, equal to the trastuzumab uh, uh, original or not. Uh, so what did they do? Uh, they recruited those uh, HER2 uh, patients uh, after, of course, uh, being sure of their um, uh, pathology. And then they uh, gave them the chemotherapy, which in the, was in the form of uh, epiropsin cyclophosphamide. Uh, randomly, uh, after that, they were given uh, this um, uh, um, biosimilar, trastuzumab, uh, with the paclitaxel or give them the original one with the uh, paclitaxel. Uh, then these patients uh, um, went to the surgery and uh, after uh, doing this uh, surgery, they were uh, switched, but not all of them. If, as you see here, you will find that uh, those patients who uh, received this biosimilar, uh, either they uh, continue on the same biosimilar for one year, or they went for the, um, um, the, um, the, the original. Or here, as you see here, uh, no, for this, they continued on the same biosimilar. But for this uh, original, they were either uh, switched to the biosimilar or for the original. And they uh, uh, continued to follow up these patients and see what did happen. Is this switching uh, differed or not? Uh, because, uh, of course, this would be meaning that it is equal or not. What did they say? They said that if you want to confirm the clinical similarity, so we have to find that the 90% uh, confidence earth interval for the risk difference and though, uh, to be between minus 13% and to 13%. And also for the risk ratio, it has to be within 0.7 to 1.3. And what did they found? Yes, as you look here, you will find that there is the local laboratory and this is the central laboratory in order to uh, be sure of the uh, results. The pathological complete response on the uh, level of the local laboratory, as you see here that the biosimilar, it showed 48% pathological response versus 40% for the uh, original. And it has the same as they uh, said before, that the risk difference between minus 13 and 13%, also for the risk ratio is between 0.7 to 1.3. What about the central laboratory? Did it find the same? Yes. It found that also the uh, biosimilar shows a pathological complete response of nearly 48% and for this original it was 40 2% approximately, and it meets, of course, the, uh, the criteria for the risk difference and the risk ratio. Uh, these are the list of the several uh, trials uh, that were held for the trastuzumab, and they compared it with this LILIC trial, uh, which is the equivalent trial, where we find that also the pathological complete response, it was nearly similar to the other uh, trials. What about the clinical comparability of this trazuzumab versus the, uh, the original one versus the uh, biosimilar? When we look for the event-free survival, we will find here, as you see, that uh, the uh, that the, uh, those patients who, uh, in this study, uh, we gave them uh, trastuzumab, uh, the uh, generic, or uh, sorry, the biosimilar, and then we continued on trastuzumab, they showed a better response than those who had this uh, biosimilar uh, all through. Yes, as you see here, those patients we had gave them oh. those patients we have gave them new adjuvant 
and those uh, they received this uh, biosimilar and then uh, they continued also with the trastuzumab which is the uh, the uh, original also in the adjuvant trial we have three uh, arms that those who continued on the same biosimilar they were in the bi in the biosimilar from the beginning and they continued it in the adjuvant uh, setting and those who received trastuzumab in the new adjuvant but they continued either the same trastuzumab the original or with to the biosimilar and as you see here, as regards the toxicity or the adverse events, we find no difference in between all these groups. What about the toxicity? Uh, is there is a difference between the uh, biosimilar and the original as regards the toxicity? And this was, uh, as you see here, uh, known in this uh, 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 table where, you uh, where it shows that uh, those patients who um, um, had at any time during the study a decline in the uh, ejection fraction by 10% or more and to below 50%, in all the three uh, arms, they were similar, as you see here. And the same for if at the end of the study, uh, any of them declined uh, the ejection fraction by 10% uh, or more and to below 50%. Also, they were nearly similar. Uh, what about the immunogenicity? Also, they have uh, nearly a similar uh, uh, results in results uh, in relation to the immunogenicity. This in brief, uh, the um, steps that uh, the biosimilar goes uh, for. First, they have to go for this in vitro uh, studies in order to have what we call analytical characterization. Then they go for in vitro uh, in order to, to see about, about the safety and the toxicity. Then the pharmacodynamic and the pharmacokinetic. And lastly, they, look, they go for this uh, if, uh, clinical efficacy and and, uh, safety and immunogenicity, it has to be tested. Now, uh, in Europe or the United States, it is um, uh, accepted that the proposed indications for the use of this uh, biosimilar match the reference uh, product, the IV, and also they use it uh, re uh, in adjuvant setting or in, um, in Europe only in the new adjuvant. Also, it is used in the metastatic uh, cases, and uh, lastly, it's also used in the metastatic uh, gastroesophageal uh, or gastric carcinoma. Thank you. If there is any question. No? Okay. So we'll go for the next uh, symposium or session.